As Robert Burns wrote, the best laid plans of mice and men often go awry. Our Indian runner ducks were turning out more difficult to manage than we expected. Of course, at the Ramshackle Ranch, there's always a solution for unruly livestock. But first, Troy checks in on our pigs at mealtime. So things have been changing up a little bit and we did have uh, some lawnmower boxes that we were using as laying pens for a, a mobile chi chicken coop. Um, but we sort of changed things up a bit and I, I was using some tyres there to feed the pigs in but what would happen is like the, the biggest pigs <laughs> would actually step into the tyre the and dominate it and get the lion's share of the food and so I'd have to put little piles of food for the um, with the smaller pigs somewhere else. And I thought that I could use these um, lawnmower catcher boxes as nice little pig troughs. It worked for three, um, but the, <laughs> this one, the pig's destructive nature sort of won out. So these are just sort of tech screwed onto this nice heavy plank and the plank, I've jammed these star pickets in to stop them moving, it's just pushing it against the fence because they will. They, they tend to push their tires when that was full of food up against the fence and actually uh, helped to short the fence a little bit, not a lot, but it was, they were definitely like clicking and ticking. So I'll have to go back to the drawing board. Um, pigs really like to get under things in their search for food. So these catcher boxes had a, a nice pronounced lip and it, held, it holds the food in there quite well and none of it is really spilled, but that one didn't have it. And of course, as soon as food got spilled under there, the pigs are up there and they've, they've ripped it off. Now this is the reason why we've got those mower boxes freed up. Um, initially we had this coop for our new chickens and the old half, um, half water tank that for our older uh, Isa brands, the brown chickens that were living in there. We've since um, switched our brown chickens into here um, rather than the, the big pen. And the smaller chickens, when we let them out in free range, because we'd, um, because we'd taken them straight out of the brooder and stuck them in the other house, they have a really strong preference for, to return back there each afternoon. So that's what we've done. So this thing, um, it's really, really easy to move because I've put those bike wheels on it and we can pump them up and it's just really straightforward. These little pipes, I had made it so they could be stowed away or taken, used for other things. And they just pull out and, and off you go, you get more leverage. We leave them out now because the chooks actually like to perch on there. They jump up and have a bit of a, a bit of a preen and a sunbathe on them, so that's pretty good. The, this thing incorporates a laying box over on this other side, over here. Of course, the other the other pen has three laying boxes built into it as well. It's like quite a large structure, even though it's permanent. So we didn't need those mower boxes anymore, and I was hoping, due to their tough nature, that they'd be good. They'd be good, um, yeah, pig feeders. But. So there we go. That's um, the ducks have responded to that quack quack <laughs> for for all of time, you know, and um, and they'll come running back. But they've become a bit hard to manage lately. So what they'll do is we'll call them back and they'll run in through the open door, eat as much as they can, and then if all the chickens haven't come back in, they'll run back out and they'll go and they'll go and stay on the neighbour's dam. That's bad for a number of reasons. It's bad because they lay their eggs over there, so they'll eat here and, and cost us in food bills, but we don't get any eggs out of them. It's bad because sooner or later a fox will twig that they're there and get them. Um, once when they stayed out one night and I, I couldn't get them back, a fox grabbed them. So they're safe in here, but they're not safe over there. And the other thing is, is like if they rush back out, it takes chickens like they'll just sort of trickle in at their leisure. They put themselves to bed really well and they're happy to be here, but those ducks sort of, they take advantage of the, the fact to get back out. And the other thing that I didn't really, um, I didn't anticipate would happen those ducks never bonded to us, like they, whatever happened in their former life, we got them already grown. They never liked us, you know, they always stayed semi-wild and afraid of us, no matter what we did, you know, hand, like trying to hand feed them, doesn't matter. They always stayed very, very wary. Now those chickens, we hand reared, and they were quite trusting of us and they would come to us. Since hanging around with the ducks, that, um, that fear of us has 
<laughs> has become infectious and now those chickens are incredibly wary and they run away from us. We can call them with food, but there's just no other way we can handle them. Whereas our Isa Browns, the brown chickens, we can do what we want. We can walk up to them, pick them up, uh, really easy to manage. So those ducks have been real trouble. Um, but never fear, we have a solution. <laughs> so um, we're going to be putting them on zero rations for 24 hours and then, um, and then we're going to be inviting them to the dinner table. I was hoping they'd turn out a bit better. Runner ducks, uh, they're supposed to lay about 300 eggs a year. But these particular ducks, um, I want to... I want to get rid of them and make way and we'll, we'll get some other ducks that we raise from younger ones just so they're a bit more tractable. Real shame. I like having them around but they're um, like we just can't manage animals that are scared of us for no reason. And it's been months, you know, we've really tried. So. Oh, too bad. The problems are over. Yeah, I've got to watch them. Uh, give us five minutes, will you? Yeah. With these ducks, it's uh, agitation is even more important than with chickens because they're um, because they're water birds. Their their feathers are really resistant to wetting. Not easy, eh? Mm -hmm. Compared to a chicken, where it just goes. Chicken just falls straight off. The thing that I've found is pretty key is to get them back into cold rinse water as quickly as we can. And at the moment, this water is cold. It's like <laughs> four or five degrees. So one of the advantages of having a, um, having a builder in the family is that when they do a bit of demolition, <laughs> they think of you um, when they have to get rid of some pine so there's quite a lot of this there's quite a lot of this pine that maybe not that bit but there's some of this stuff that looks um very very nice and straight grained almost like it's been quarter sawn so pascal and i have talked about a few projects like shelving and stuff like that and we've just been holding off on getting the materials we've been a bit busy um, but also we just want to um, see how we went for scavenging and lo and behold all of this has come to us. Well, the chook pen's looking just as rough as ever. <laughs> we haven't got round to fully renovating it yet. But our rooster's looking pretty fancy. Um, that's air raid. So, um, about a week ago, he just found his... He just found his voice um, and he sounded a bit more like a klaxon horn, but um, he's really starting to sound like a rooster. So he's dominating the pack at the moment. That's bad news for the other roosters. Eh? We have to find something to do with them. Um, we, might, we might look to rehome them in the area because they are really good looking roosters. It'd be a shame just to turn them into soup, but um, we'll see how we go. So. I was hoping that the black rooster would come to the fore, but um, it looks like Air Raid with his golden golden hackles. Um, <coughs> he's ruling the roost, as it were. He's actually not as big as the other uh, other blue Australop uh, rooster, but it's not the size of the dog in the fight, I guess. The fancy boy. He's a show off. Well, I've managed to make um, Pascal pretty happy with these shelves. They're already, we're already starting to put some stuff away. She's... Um, preserved she, lemons. <laughs> yeah, she's been making preserved lemons and all sorts of things like that. So there's lots of holes and stuff all through, you know, where we pulled the nails out. Um, or actually my other brother-in-law did, did that for this lot. So thank you for all my brother-in-laws. 
Um, so we've pulled out all the nails and we've just oiled this pine and made the, the basic framework. And then this is some, um, some flooring board. I'll just kick the dog out of there so its toenails don't get on the audio. Um, so yeah, all recycled stuff. But Pasky's already started putting, you know, like we found these, not vintage, but we found these old school uh, preserving jars. We're just getting lids for those. So they're, they're all waiting. This is the, the kombucha. <laughs> <laughs> section these are just waiting um, they've been back sugared so they'll be getting nice and fizzy so we drink an enormous amount of that stuff um, no soft drink or anything like that down here we've got um, this is our second run of cider obviously we've got more cider brewing here where it's nice and dark but it's nicely out of the way uh, meat mincer for when we're making sausages and of course we've got more empty bottles that we're ready to make more cider. Um, we've got the cherry season coming up soon so we're actually we want to reserve some of these to tr try our hand at some fruit wines. If anyone's got any experience with that and they've um, maybe not recipes but if you've got some tips or pitfalls for people that are just getting into fruit wines we'd love to hear from you in the comments. We've had some really great advice coming through. Um, you guys are a real resource for us so thank you if you if you've helped us out in the comments and we look forward to some more of them. So yeah, we've still got some empty space, but um, Pasky's a hard worker, so I can imagine this just pop, 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 filling up pretty quickly. There you go, some um, recycled timber. It's got a new lease of life, and we are super happy with the result. So, I'm just doing a trial run with my new All-American pressure cooker. Um, this is pretty exciting. We've got this pressure cooker because we want to start canning a lot of our meat and um, canning vegetables and preserves from the garden as well in the future. Uh, it's just, we're just finding we've got one freezer that's chock-a-block and then the freezer in, of our inside fridge that's also full and things like broth in particular are taking up a lot of space. So I thought it would be really great to invest in one of these for life. Um, particularly just to get all our jars of bone broth um, on the shelf instead of taking up really up really valuable space in the freezer. So that's what I'm doing today. I'm um, doing a whole lot of broth uh, to store on the shelf so that it's out of the freezer. So there were a couple of two litre batches that were in the freezer that I've defrosted and I'm going to reheat and then I'm making up some more broth with um, the, those duck frames from the ducks that we processed a couple of weeks ago. That's all um, outside on our, in our big stainless pot um, boiling away to make beautiful duck stock. So I've got three inches of water in here and as that steam was coming out I just put the pressure weight on here. So I've just put it onto 10 psi um, and I'm just waiting for it to start to jiggle and then I can moderate the, um, the heat source, the gas, um, down the bottom and just get it just right um, and just check that it does come up to 10. I'm just doing a run through to make sure it all works before I actually start canning with our, our produce. pint jars that I'm using are Australian Fowler's Vicola jars. Pressure canning is not really practiced that much in Australia, but I was hoping they would still work in the increased temperature. This is trotter gear, basically pig's trotters slow cooked with wine and aromatic herbs and vegetables to make a gelatinous broth. It is a recipe from British chef Fergus Henderson, and it is the base of many delicious game dishes that we look forward to trying in the future. Before putting the duck broth into a litre or quart sized mason jars, I skimmed off the fat from the surface.
Once the contents of the pot came up to pressure, I cooked the jars for 25 minutes. I then turned off the heat and allowed the pressure to return to zero before removing the weight and waiting 10 minutes to remove the jars. Because of the different sized jars, they didn't all fit in the first round, so I had to put on a second batch of pint jars. As there is no rubber gasket, it is important to keep the metal on metal seal lubricated with a thin layer of olive oil, and make sure that the lid is sitting evenly when you tighten the screws. I wasn't sure I'd got it exactly right, so I undid the screws and readjusted the lid. Whilst the second batch of broth was canning, I prepared some leaf lard and back fat for rendering by placing chopped up pieces through the mincer on a thick grind. I've discovered from watching Carolyn on the Homestead Family Channel that mincing the slightly frozen fat first makes it much easier to render down at low heat with minimum waste. It's also important not to mix the two different types of fat as leaf lard is particularly useful as shortening in baking pastry. I will let you know how I go with it next time I bake a pie. Start with a small amount on the lowest heat setting possible and stir until the fat begins to render out. Once you have a half inch or a couple of centimetres of fat rendered out, you can add more fat to the saucepan. While the lard was rendering, it was time to take out my jarred stock. When I opened the lid, I saw that the seal had failed on one of the jars. I grabbed the camera to film it and then got hit with another jar with a failed seal. The seal could have failed for a couple of reasons. Firstly, with this second batch, I did not wait the full 10 minutes after the pressure had neutralised to remove the lid. Secondly, I think one clip on these jars is not always strong enough to hold the pressure. In the future, I will be using two clips at right angles when I am canning with these particular jars. I was grateful that the camera survived the broth spray. I didn't get burnt and we only lost two jars of broth from my negligence. You can tell the lard is ready when it looks like all the water and impurities have evaporated and only teeny tiny bubbles are coming to the surface. So I cooked the duck in lard last night and duck fat um, overnight in the slow cooker and it hasn't really turned out how I wanted it to. It's very, very dry. What we'll do is I'm going to like pull the meat off the bones and rip it up and we'll probably be able to use it in cooking. Probably be really nice in soups and pasta dishes. Bit of a shame we can't eat it as is. The skin's yummy as a snack as is, but um, it's very, very dry. I've made duck confit before um, in the Shuttle Chef, so maybe I should have done it in the Shuttle Chef. It's not quite so hot in there. And also it could have just been that the duck that we used was quite tough. It was, they were quite skinny ducks. There wasn't much fat on them, so perhaps that um, contributed to the, the drier texture but yeah we'll still be able to use it it's just not what I expected and we'll still be able to skim off all that beautiful lard because I'm covering the duck with the lard it should keep for about a month or so in a cool space on the shelf before we'll need to use it With the confit done, I'm making a quick pâté with the duck liver, heart and gizzards. Frying them in plenty of butter is key to a delicious pâté, and also a splash of brandy for good measure.
Allow to cool slightly, then add to a food processor with slow cooked shallots and more butter. Pushing the mixture that's come out of the food processor through a sieve makes the pâté really smooth. I added some sage from our local community garden. I tend to seal my pate out with clarified butter to make it last longer in the fridge. Feeling rich, I stacked our homemade bone broth onto our bespoke shelves. Jarred like this, our bone broths have a shelf life of a year, and I was pleased to have freed up all that space in the freezer. Join us next week as we harvest some wild asparagus spears and corms to plant in our new perennial bed. We'll also take you through a time lapse of what our first no dig garden bed has produced for us through this spring. Thanks so much for watching this week, and if you're new here, thanks also for subscribing, as it really helps get our videos recommended to a like-minded audience. See you next week.